Uh, what's up, guys? I'm Zap, uh, the program manager of Renew Nashville at the Entrepreneur Center, but still always managing membership and all of these awesome virtual events. I'm super stoked because one of the great value of this virtual world is that we can bring in uh, speakers from all over. So we have Mike Lingle coming to us all the way from Florida, zooming in, uh, because he is just a financials expert. Uh, and stoked to have you here, Mike, sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, but I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you for uh, the invitation to present here. Hello, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen. Give me one second here. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Can everyone see my... Uh... Yep, you're, we're good. Great. And let me just get the... Zoom makes me like reopen all the windows every time I share the screen. So hold on one second. All right, now I have the chat open uh, and I have a second monitor here. So when I look this way, I'm actually looking at your faces just so it's a little more personal. Beautiful, okay. high tech. High tech. All right, uh, <laughs> great. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Mike Lingle. Oh, that didn't work. My name is Mike Lingle. Uh, I do a ton of work with startups. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur my entire career, other than the brief stint I was discussing with Zap, uh, where I wanted to be an architect. Um, but pretty quickly shifted from that into technology and then just started running my own companies. Um, I do a lot of work now. Uh, you know, I started as a software developer. Then I started trying to run the company. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then uh, we raised some venture capital. We had an exit. And uh, I've done a ton of work with other startups. So I've run a few accelerator programs. I help um, a bunch of startups with fundraising, with pitch decks. All of my startups were presentation startups. Um, so I do a lot of pitch deck work. Uh, and I have recently become very obsessed with uh, financials, financial projections, and trying to make that piece easy for entrepreneurs. I think um, as an entrepreneur, you know, I was always good with the product. I was not always as great with the numbers. Um, so I've become, I've become obsessed with that recently. So you can email me, mike at rocketproforma.com. Uh, you can also check out uh, rocketperformer.com resources. I will actually show you a slide template as part of this presentation. That slide template is free. You can download it. There are other uh, slide templates and other resources there uh, that you can check out for free. All right. Um, and I like to keep this conversational. So uh, feel free to post things to the chat or uh, speak up as I go through this. Um, and the basic idea here is just to give some, uh, some streamlined financial education. So as entrepreneurs, we don't necessarily need to become accountants, uh, but we need to understand the basics of how um, money flows through the business. And uh, there's just you know, some frameworks uh, that the accountants have that we don't have as entrepreneurs and that took me a while to figure out. And briefly, uh, you know, I started my first company um, uh, long enough ago, I guess it was 1995 or something. Uh, and I was a software developer. Very quickly, uh, things took off. I didn't actually raise any money for that company, but um, we were doing well. I brought in a business partner. We started hiring people. We were doing great. Uh, and then all of a sudden we hit, um, uh, the economy hit a rough patch. And our financials looked very healthy. We had a bunch of Fortune 500 companies who owed us money, but those companies stopped paying their bills. And we quickly realized that we had no cash buffer. And so that, um, that uh, quickly became a giant problem. My business partner and I had to lay off most of the um, awesome people that we had hired. Uh, still one of the worst professional experiences I've had. And I felt a real responsibility to these people. You know, they had, uh, 
bet their careers on us and we had really let them down. Um, my business partner left as part of that uh, and I was left with a company um, that had potential, had customers, had lost a lot of its staff and had a bunch of debt. Uh, and I actually brought that company back from the brink and paid off all the debt, um, but it significantly affected the ability of the company to perform moving forward because I was constantly backfilling the debt as opposed to investing in growth. Um, and as part of that uh, sort of rebirth, I realized that I really needed to figure out the, the financials piece of the business and do a much better job with that. Um, and one of the things I started doing was doing my own QuickBooks uh, so that I really started to understand I had been outsourcing all of the bookkeeping. And so I started doing uh, the QuickBooks. I started trying to understand how the financials worked um, ended up bringing that company back from the brink, brought in a new business partner, and uh, we launched um, a new version of our product in the cloud, presentations in the cloud called Slide Rocket. And for that, uh, we ended up raising a $2 million Series A from um, Hummer Winblad, a venture capital firm in San Francisco. Uh, I built a lot of the financial model that we used during that raise, so I had really turned around my financial knowledge in that time. And then once we raised the $2 million, we actually used that financial model to run the business for the first year. So it was not just a smoke and mirrors financial model, it was, it was actually a tool that we could use. And that whole situation went much better. Um, you know, once, once we understand the, so the numbers, we ran the company uh, and that we raised another round, a second round of VC funding and that company ended up getting acquired. So much happier once I understood the finance piece. And then I was reading about Bill Gates um, and he had a rule at Microsoft in the early days that they always had to have a year of cash in the bank, right? And that was something that, um, you know, we didn't have that kind of buffer. I, you know, a year of cash may be too extreme, uh, but he is now one of the richest people in the world and I am not. So I assume he knows what he's talking about. Uh, but he had that kind of cash buffer from Microsoft and his, his thinking was, look, you know, we've hired all these smart people. If something horrible happens, you know, fast forward to a global pandemic in 2020, uh, we'll have a year and a bunch of smart people to figure out how we can pivot and fix the business. Um, so then after the exit, uh, I was good enough with the financial models, you know, and I understood the fundraising process. So I started helping a bunch of entrepreneurs raise money and I was building financial models for people, uh, but realized I was actually doing them a disservice um, because they still didn't understand the finance piece. So that leads me to today uh, where I do sessions like this to try to help people get a running start understanding the financial frameworks. Um, and then I've also created a spreadsheet template uh, for startups called Rocket Proforma. And so today um, we're gonna talk about financial projections uh, I have a particular format that I really like that works well as a dashboard for running the company and also works well when going out to pitch investors. Um, we're going to do just a little bit of accounting basics. We're going to talk about the three financial statements. We're going to talk about cash and accrual, which is a key concept for both for running the business and for understanding those financial statements and how they fit together. Uh, we're going to talk about expenses. And we're going to talk about uh, cost of goods sold. And if we have time, we'll do a little bit around uh, constructing business models and thinking about how to, um, how to structure uh, your cash flywheel, borrowing a little bit from the Amazon flywheel concept that you probably will hear about if you hang around in the startup world long enough. All right. Uh, so I do like to know um, if there's any specific questions at the beginning of this. Uh, you can either speak up or type them in the chat, or as I'm going, feel free to type things in the chat or speak up. But are there any specific things that uh, you would like me to cover as part of this session? I have a question. Um, hi, yeah. my name is Deborah Ann. How are you doing today? How are you? I'm great. I'm here at Fort Campbell with the military soldiers hanging out, um, and great. I'm excited about what I'm doing. I would like to really know what percentage of um, what I do with my business in a home-based business, um, I have a writing business, I'm a content creator and a resume writer, what percentage of that can I utilize for my 
business expenses. If there's a magic formula for whatever, if you let me know, then I'll take a note and um, I will make a jot of note. Unfortunately, just so you'll know, my, um, my bookkeeper kept my stuff for four months, five months, and I'm having to, I just got them back and I'm having to do my own uh, for this year and last year, and I have to have them done by tomorrow. So this is a great session. So thank you. Okay, great. That sounds uh, incredibly rushed and painful. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. But it must be done. All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, I want to ask something. Hello. Go ahead. Um, you know, in some business models, it's free to play or f and it, this commercialization just supposed to happen much later down the road. And uh, if you can also show how the financial state statements will apply in those cases, uh, not just like uh, slowly growing up revenue. And if those have a chance to attract like um, a larger VC funding from the get go and uh, with, with, with a decent financial deck, I've been criticized to not have a financial deck because um, I have a free to play like educational game business that I'm trying to grow. And um, I want to incorporate such financial deck to my slide deck and uh, and I, I wasn't sure uh, from the videos online okay. and how to approach that. If you can give some pointers on that, thank you very much. That's fine. I can talk about that. Anything else? And again, feel free to post to the chat as we're going through this or uh, just speak up. Okay. Uh, so finance is the language of business. Um, you know, people, and I'm one of these people, I started a company because I was a creator, right? I was really good at making stuff. Um, that did not make me good at running the business. And as I mentioned in my story, I circled back around to understanding the finance piece, but really business is about finance. Um, and the I, best, the best really startups combine uh, the product so the with the customer and the market and then the management. And magic happens when we start to get all three of these things right. And really the goal of a startup is to create a working business model, not just to create a great product. And so where I see, and I, again, I work with hundreds and hundreds of startups, uh, typically the product or service is solid. Um, you know, the one place where people trip is the market and the customers. Sometimes they don't have a real handle on who the customer is. Uh, and then two is, um, you know, they trip over the numbers and the management piece. So unfortunately, as entrepreneurs, we have to work all of those muscles. And then I think, um, you know, in my work with startups on the financial side, the trigger for creating financial projections is often raising money. Um, so all of a sudden I have to show something to investors. I need financial projections. I'm in a rush. Uh, but really financial projections should be core to conceiving and running your business, regardless of whether you're raising money or not. Um, they are that important and foundational. But certainly if it's the investor pitch that gets you to do it, that's, that's fine too. All right, so this is the dashboard that I use uh, both for running my own business and that I recommend for raising money from investors. Again, this is available uh, up on rocketproforma.com slash resources. And so this is my template. And typically what, and we'll circle back around and I'll explain what's going on, but I wanna just call out for a minute, most people's reaction to seeing this is to completely go, like their brain just goes on overload, right? Um, and I'm sure, you know, that's, that's the response that I had originally. And I'm sure a lot of people on, that, on this call just had that response when I flashed that slide up. Don't worry, we're gonna get, we're gonna rebuild that slide from the ground up and explain what's happening. And what is happening is there's information overload, right? Um, so there's clearly math involved. That tends to freak people out. Uh, there are lots of little boxes. And really what those little boxes are mostly is time. So money is always in motion and we're looking at slices of time. There, uh, in my template, we're also looking at cash versus accrual. We're gonna do a deep dive on that in a minute. And then we're looking at different types of costs. So some of the lines that you're seeing, uh, and this is kind of an accounting framework, are showing the cost of goods sold versus the operating expenses. 
Again, we'll talk about that in a second. The good news is all of this is actually pretty simple. The math is definitely simple. It's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, and some division is expressed as percentages or ratios. Uh, but there isn't much complicated math. There's just a lot of math because there are a lot of boxes. But there aren't complicated formulas like there are. There aren't algorithms like there are when we're designing software. And the rest is simple too. Um, oh, and yes, uh, that is correct. Uh, I do share a home office so every once in a while you'll hear someone else talking, apologize. Uh, so talking about the, um, the three financial statements, so we'll do just a little bit of accounting here. The three financial statements are the income statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet. The income statement is what we submit to the IRS. That's how we pay our taxes. Um, we show an income statement. The income statement is on something called the accrual basis which is not necessarily cash. So it's easy for the income statement to not match, match the cash flow in your business and not match uh, the cash in your bank account. The cash flow statement is on the cash basis uh, and accountants use the income statement as a starting point and then go immediately to the cash flow statement to see how much cash is actually available in the business. And we'll, I'll explain this in a second. And then the balance sheet shows uh, what the company owns and also what it owes and then gives you a net worth at the end of that calculation. The balance sheet is also on the accrual basis, typically. Um, and we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a second. But this is the reason that we have the three statements is to get a complete picture, both of what's coming in and what's actually uh, happening in the business. And so accountants are very used to looking at both the income statement and the cash flow statement and sometimes the balance sheet. We as normal humans, as entrepreneurs, are not, we don't think that way at all. We just want to see everything in one place. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how we can solve that problem in a minute. So shout out to accountants. Uh, this is not an accounting lesson. This is just enough accounting to um, make everyone feel comfortable here. So let's talk about cash versus accrual, because this is key, and it took me a little while to understand this. No one explained it to me in entrepreneur school, uh, but this is key here. So the cash basis works like my wallet. If I walk into uh, the coffee shop and I pay for the coffee with cash, I hand over the cash, I get the coffee. The coffee shop is holding my cash. I no longer have the cash in my wallet. I have the coffee. The accrual basis works more like a credit card where there's a lag. So I get the coffee if I pay with a credit card, but I'm still holding the cash. Eventually, the coffee shop will take possession of the cash, but there's a lag between when that happens, right? And actually, in this case, the credit card steps in as a, as a uh, middleman and lends, essentially lends me the cash to pay the um, coffee shop immediately, which is why I pay interest if I over, uh, if I delay paying them. So you can think of cash as cash, you can think of accrual as credit cards. It's a little more complicated than that, but we'll, we'll talk through that. So there are lots of places where the accrual basis and the cash basis start to differ. So one is accounts receivable. Um, this typically happens with uh, companies who have business customers, which is where I send an invoice and that customer makes me wait to pay me. And this is what happened uh, when my first business hit the wall uh, was we had a lot of invoices out. We just couldn't collect because the economy was uh, hitting a rough patch. So people weren't paying. Accounts payable is the inverse of that. Um, you know, you send me a bill and I take a few weeks to pay uh, and you call me and bug me but uh, you know, you're waiting for the money to come from me during that time. So there's a lag again. Deferred revenue, we'll talk about this. This is a superpower of subscription business models, but this is essentially annual subscribers pay up front. So I take a year of cash in up front for that subscription. Capital expenses don't appear on in the income statement at all. Uh, these are things like large equipment purchases. Um, back when we used to have offices, these were office build outs. Uh, it could also be if I'm buying a building or buying land, 
these are all capital expenses uh, that don't appear. Or if I'm buying a bunch of inventory, that kind of thing doesn't appear on the income statement, but, but could be a huge cash expense. Again, when we all had offices, security deposits uh, were a big thing. And so you'll see, I can just keep going on and on with this list. And so continuing our theme of cash versus accrual, let's talk about how accounts receivable works. So again, this is where I send an invoice to a big company and that big company takes my invoice and then takes 60 days to pay me the cash. So what happens during that time? So I invoice the client on the accrual basis, which is my income statement. Uh, and the income statement is also called the profit and loss statement, sometimes referred to as the P&L. I record that $12,000 of income because I've sent out the invoice. The, um, and uh, if I were to pay taxes right at that moment, I would need to pay taxes on that $12,000 because I'm submitting the income statement to the government, um, which is actually why we don't submit taxes until April. So, that, or for business, it's March actually, for personal, it's April. But so that there's a little bit of lag so we can collect that money and not get caught, um, you know, paying taxes on money we haven't collected. But I declare that income on the profit and loss statement and then I add a $12,000 asset to the accounts receivable category on my uh, balance sheet that says, you know, I am owed this $12,000, the client will pay it eventually. But no money has changed hands. And now we're gonna wait 60 days. So in month two, we're waiting, uh, nothing happens on the income statement or on the balance sheet but I, I do have to keep paying money to run the business. And this is where, you know, this is this lag is where I got into trouble in my story. And this is where companies need to either borrow money or raise money uh, in order to pay expenses. Then in month three, we finally, you know, my customer finally pays me that $12,000. That $12,000 that I received, there is no change to the income statement or profit and loss statement because I've already declared the income over here two months ago. Uh, I draw down that accounts receivable uh, entry on my balance sheet by $12,000 and then I finally re receive the cash into the bank account. So that was a 60 day lag, um, but you can see the income statement and the cash flow statement are moving separately. Accounts payable. Accounts payable works the other way. So this is someone sends me a bill uh, in this case, that becomes a uh, that becomes a, an expense on my profit and loss statement, on my income statement. So we record the twelve thousand dollar expense immediately. Uh, we also uh, add twelve thousand dollars to our accounts payable entry on the balance sheet, which is a liability. So I owe that money. But let's say I'm being uh, incredibly mean, and I'm going to wait two months to pay this bill. So no cash changes hands, uh, my vendor is waiting. They may have to borrow money during month two in order to finance their business. And then finally, you know, I pay the $12,000 bill. No change is recorded on the P&L. We draw down that accounts payable liability on the balance sheet. So we no longer have that liability on the balance sheet. And then uh, we pay out the $12,000 in cash. So again, this was a pretty significant lag uh, between the income statement and the uh, cash flow statement. And I see a question, uh, what is the definition of the word accrual? Uh, I totally agree. Investopedia.com is a great resource for this. Basically, the definition of the word accrual is there's a lag. Um, so the transaction, the actual cash doesn't, doesn't transfer immediately versus the cash basis is all about cash and what's happening with cash. Okay, so another place where there's a difference uh, between the income statement or profit and loss statement and the cash flow statement is deferred revenue. And this is a superpower of subscription businesses uh, and is one reason uh, I really like subscription businesses. And so this is what happens when we go to subscribe to something and we have the choice to pay monthly, in which case it's just a normal, uh, normal transaction versus annually. And if we pick the annual amount, so in this case, we get this $1,000 a month uh, 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 bill 
if we prepay annually. So we're actually gonna pay $12,000 in order to get this $1,000 a month price. And the company is going to receive that $12,000 as a lump sum up front, but uh, on the accrual basis, we're only gonna recognize the revenue on the income statement monthly. Um, so we're gonna recognize $1,000 a month as income, but we're gonna take the $12,000 in as cash. So here's the way that looks. So, you know, I subscribe, the company receives the $12,000. That company is going to add uh, $1,000 of income, which is one twelfth, one month's worth of the $12,000 to their profit and loss statement. And they're going to create a deferred revenue account on their balance sheet uh, and add $11,000 to that deferred revenue account, which is a liability. They have taken in the money and now they need to provide the service. They get the $12,000 right away. In month two, they're going to declare another 12th of the total amount as income. So in this case, that's $1,000 a month. They're going to remove $1,000 from this liability. So now they only owe $10,000 in deferred revenue. No cash changes hands. Month three, they repeat the same process. Another 1 12th, which in this case is $1,000 to the P&L. Uh, they reduce the deferred revenue liability by 1000 and no cash changes hands. And they proceed this way for the entire year. And then the customer renews and the cycle starts over with another $12,000 in cash up front for the year. And so the beauty of this for the company is this actually helps fund operations for much longer uh, because you're taking in this money up front. And again, one of the superpowers of subscription companies is you can pre-sell two-year and three-year subscriptions. And I don't see companies do this enough. So when I was creating the website for Rocket Proforma, I used Wix and uh, they immediately offered me um, not just an annual subscription, but also a two-year and a three-year subscription. Uh, and the beauty of this page, I love uh, user interface, especially when someone else has put a lot of work into figuring out the psychology. Nowhere on this page does it tell me the price. It only tells me how much I'm saving. Uh, it's complete genius. But Obviously, taking three years of revenue up front and offering a deal is great for them, right? Wix is going to be around. It doesn't really cost them that much more to support me for those extra few years. But the difference in cash that they're taking up front, if they can convince me to do this two-year or three-year deal, is tremendously helpful to their, to their business and running their operations. Um, so that's a quick tour of cash and accrual. And again, I wish someone had explained this to me on day one. Uh, you all have the benefit of accelerators to explain this stuff to you. I was kind of making it up as I went along. But at the end of the day, cash and accrual are simply two tools that you will use. It's not that you're going to pick one or the other. Um, it's not that your accountant is going to pick one or the other. It's that they fit together. Um, and you're gonna end up using both tools. And if I'm doing a project at home, I need both the hammer and the screwdriver in order to accomplish that project. Uh, in e-commerce transactions involving physical products, uh, I'm reading a question from the chat. Is the revenue recognized at the time of sale, time of shipping or customer delivery? Um, I should preface this by saying I am not an accountant. Uh, I have certainly figured out a bunch of this stuff, but the actual answer here is to ask your accountant. Um, and uh, also the question that came up about uh, which expenses you can write off is also a question for the accountant, but I will, I will do my best to offer both, to answer both of those questions now. Um, I think that the actual delivery in the same way the deferred revenue um, the deferred revenue is a liability. I believe uh, if you take the money but haven't delivered the product yet, you have a liability on the balance sheet until such time as you've actually delivered the product and completed the transaction. So there may be some kind of accounting lag uh, before you can fully declare the income. But again, check with your accountant. But really, you need to take the money and you need to deliver the product or service in order for the transaction to be complete usually. Uh, the second thing is, if you are running a business, 
you can typically write off all of the expenses of that business. Uh, the catch is you do need to be making money. You need to have what accountants call basis, which is at some point that business needs to generate taxable income. You cannot just run a business at a loss forever or the IRS will get upset at some point. Um, but you can definitely write off your business expenses against uh, money that you're bringing in. And it's okay to have a few years of losing money. You just can't start a money losing business and then just keep it losing money forever. Uh, okay, in the last example where the actual price wasn't listed, how does that impact potential customer? It would throw me, I'm developing an online course that will have cash and accrual components. Sorry I was late, had an online course Zoom. I don't actually understand that question. Uh, if you have an online course, um, I think it's, it's asking of, about the, the Wix site not having the price. I think it's getting oh, outside of the numbers, okay. maybe. Yeah, for an online course, you're going to have to put the, you're probably going to have to put the price in there. Um, I like that Wix sheet because it only shows you what you're saving. But when you click one of these things, it takes you to a separate page that does show you the price and you have a checkout window. So this was kind of the pre, this is kind of the pricing page. Um, but eventually you do have to show people the, the price. This was just a nice abstraction. Uh, do you have a tax bracket sheet that shows percentage that we should declare from our earnings? What makes us able to pay subcontractors as a 1099 or as a W-2? Uh, again, talk to your accountant about that. Um, the short story is 1099 contractors are people who do not work for you full time and can credibly make the case that they have other income from other clients. Uh, W-2 are people who either you employ full-time uh, um, responsibly or they're contractors you employ full-time and are trying to pretend that they're contractors, but really they're working 40 hours a week and drawing 100% of their, their um, income from you. Those people are technically still W-2s. Okay. And I'll add that uh, you need to just have an advising meeting with an accountant. You should be able to book that on the advisor platform if you're able to get on there. Yeah. And tax bracket percentages are actually a complicated, uh, there is no easy answer to that. It is very situation specific. All right. Um, but this is good, please keep the questions coming. So for the financial statements, again, just quick recap, income statement, also called the profit and loss statement or p and on the accrual basis typically, cash flow statement on the cash basis, balance sheet on the accrual basis. The income statement shows you, um, you know, the, your revenue and expenses, not necessarily in real time, but with a little bit of a lag. The cash flow statement shows you cash moving in real time and typically accountants want to see both, um, which is, it totally makes sense to accountants, it is confusing for the rest of us. And the balance sheet shows the net worth of the company. So most of the time that's positive. You know, the company has created uh, long-term value. And so there's a positive net worth. Certainly there are many examples of companies that have destroyed shareholder value. Like when WeWork tried to go public last year and release their financials, they had a negative $2 billion uh, equity value on their balance sheet. And that's before their, their uh, stock price cratered. Okay, so we covered this. The income statement is also called the profit and loss or p &L. So just a quick uh, little bit more info on each of these. Income statement on the, profit, uh, on the accrual basis. It shows, uh, revenue and expenses. It does not show important cash items like inventory. Uh, inventory moves around on the balance sheet and the cash flow statement, and then only shows up on the income statement as cost of goods sold that matches uh, whatever the revenue sold for that period was. Um, the income statement also doesn't show accounts receivable, which is the difference between invoicing and cash and deferred revenue, which you just talked about for subscriptions. Is there a question? 
Okay, can you uh, hold it? Hold, hold that yeah, screen one more time. I'm trying to take notes. Can you say okay. that one more time, number two, please? Yes. Uh, so the income statement, because it's on the accrual basis, does not show, give a true picture of your inventory spending. So if you buy a bunch of inventory, that shows up as a capital expense. So it shows up as an asset on the balance sheet and the cash you spend on the inventory shows up on the cash flow statement, but it does not show up on the income statement. The only thing that shows up on the income statement is the value of the inventory that matches the number of units that were sold during that period. Is that the okay. part you wanted me to repeat? Yes, I'm typing and okay. taking notes. So okay. I, it doesn't really make sense, but I'm typing it. So I got it. Okay, good. Thank you. We'll pass around a, um, uh, Zap is making a recording of this. Uh, but inventory is its own beast. And again, you know, Zap just uh, offered free accounting sessions. So if you have inventory, I would definitely talk to an accountant um, because it's got its own special way of, um, uh, of dealing, of planning and strategy. Okay, uh, the income statement does not include cash that comes in from investors or loans. Um, you know, that money shows up in the cash flow statement uh, and some of that shows up on the balance sheet, but that can dramatically change. You know, if you go out and raise $500,000 from investors, that dramatically changes your cash position, but does not change your income statement because it's not revenue. Uh, and again, it doesn't include capital expenses, which are large equipment purchases, purchases of inventory, purchases of land, buildings, office buildouts, None of that. Um, I'm not going to cover depreciation, but it also, if you do buy something expensive, you may, um, that, that item declines in value over a period of years, and that's called depreciation. That shows up on your income statement, but it's not cash. Uh, it's simply accounting. On the cash flow statement, uh, this is always on the cash basis. It always gives you a snapshot of how much cash your company actually has during that period. Uh, and it removes all the non-cash items like depreciation and whatever else. It includes cash from investors or loans. It includes payments of loans. Uh, and it includes cash for capital expenses, inventory purchases, all of that stuff. And then the balance sheet, typically on the accrual basis, it's a snapshot of what your company owns, so the assets, and owes the liability. And from there, uh, it gives you a net worth. And the way it calculates the net worth, the assets, you take the assets, and then that has to match the, li the liabilities plus the equity. So what the company owns minus what the company owes essentially solves for the equity or the shareholder value of the company. And that gives you a net worth. That net worth does not necessarily match the share price of your startup. If you're raising money or offering options, it's a different calculation than that, um, but it does give you uh, a value for the net worth of your company. I do a whole separate presentation on fundraising. Uh, so if you wanna learn more about that, just hit me up and come to my next uh, webinar. Okay, I'm, oh, we're talking about motorcycles. That's awesome, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm a pre-revenue bootstrapped Delaware corporation. We were established June of this year. I want to make sure I don't incur any penalties and fines when filing for taxes. We are tight on money, so not sure if I should hire an accountant, tax lawyer, bookkeeper, or CPA. What do you recommend? Uh, so the CPA is the accountant. Um, you are going to need an accountant no matter what. Uh, I don't know how complicated your Delaware Corporation is, uh, if you have multiple shareholders, you probably need a lawyer. Um, but if you registered the company yourself, which I've done in the past, I've registered uh, corporations before on my own. In that case, I would definitely get the accountant, uh, talk to the accountant and let the accountant tell you what you need. Um, the reason you need lawyers is usually for shareholders. 
lawyers have some knowledge of taxes, but really the, the accountant is the best place to start, I think, in that scenario. And again, you're in luck. Uh, Zap has uh, free access to um, accountants for you. So I would start with the free access, ask your questions and see where that takes you. Advice on how and where we include startup cost figures. Should this be separate from the P&L? Uh, so the short answer to this question is not such a short answer. Uh, there are typically, sorry, there are typically multiple kinds of expenses. So this is the sheet, um, the template that I put together, the Rocket Performa template that startups use to answer this question. And there are startup costs in a couple places on this sheet. So one place is, and we'll talk about this in a second, these are operating expenses. Um, and we'll talk about the difference between operating and capital expenses in a minute. But these are things uh, that I might use in developing my product or low cost purchases um, of you know, laptops or desks or stuff like that. This is one place where I put part of startup expenses. So I would, I would list the expense, uh, you know, uh, let's see, developing minimum viable product, 5,500 bucks, that's gonna happen in month three, and that's gonna be an R&D expense of uh, operating expenses. That's one place that those things can go. Um, and in the case of the sheet, I can just turn that on or off if I want. Another place that things may go is in capital expenses. And these are typically things like office build outs, uh, a very expensive furniture purchase, equipment purchases, uh, expensive computers. If you're buying Macs, you may uh, be able to depreciate those versus expense them immediately. Um, and those are capital expenses, which means uh, they're, they're larger ticket items. So my geeky answer to your question is some of your startup costs will be operating expenses, in which case you would categorize them as sales and marketing research and development, which is basically uh, product or general ad administrative. And then separately, you may have startup expenses that are capital expenses. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, does, your fundraiser, does your fundraising cover nonprofit fundraising, fundraising class? I have not done a class specifically on nonprofit fundraising. Um, the secret of nonprofits is that they actually do make money uh, and they have similar, they can have similar expenses to for-profit companies. Um, so it's not that there's not money moving through the company. Uh, and in fact, you know, the B Corp stuff has become very popular. Sustainability has become very popular. Responsible governance has become very popular. There are lots of instances where there are um, great companies that may be nonprofit that are able to raise money. Uh, can you flip back really quickly to the cash flow slide? Yes, I can. <clears throat> and again, uh, Zap will send out a recording of this after the fact, so you will all be able to look at this. Yep, there will be recording, sorry about that people stopping in the office. I've got three interns, no three new employees right now. <laughs> oh man, staying busy. Uh, yeah, I had three people start in about two weeks time. So it's definitely been staying busy. But yeah, I have all the registrants and I'll send the link to one. Okay. Great, uh, and someone just posted, uh, Center for Nonprofit Management is a great resource for fundraising development classes. So definitely check that out. Uh, it sounds like they specialize in nonprofits. All right, so now what we're gonna do, now that we've done a little mini accounting class, we're gonna build back up the slide I showed you at the beginning and it's gonna feel a lot less complicated. I promise. All right. So the way that um, the income statement works is we're gonna take revenue and we're gonna subtract expenses and that's gonna give us a profit or a loss. So basic addition, of course the accountants make it a little more complicated than that, but not much more. 
So here is one slice of what I flashed up on the screen before. This is month eight. Remember, each slice is uh, time, and I'll, I'll walk you through what that time is, but in this case, we're looking at a month. And so this middle piece here, this is the income statement. So we see the revenue, we see the cost of goods sold, which is a specific type of expense. Uh, we see the operating expenses, and then we see uh, the profit or loss, which in this case is called EBITDA. And then there, are, you know, we've decorated that with a few metrics. Um, we look at the revenue growth from the previous period. We look at the gross profit and the gross margin percentage. And then we look at the EBITDA margin percentage. So these are just metrics that um, we have on tap. And so the revenue comes in. Uh, and one thing I will say, uh, in order to make these easier to read, I typically divide everything by 1,000. So revenue 48 is 48,000. Cost of goods sold of 22 is 22,000. When I take that 48,000 uh, and subtract 22,000, I'm left with a $26,000 gross profit which gives me a 54% profit margin. 54% is calculated as the $26,000 uh, of the $48,000 of revenue. I then, in true startup fashion, spend way more money than I have available. So I spend $92,000 of that $26,000, which gives me a negative $66,000 EBITDA, which is why I need to go raise money for this startup. Uh, the cost of goods sold, um, we'll talk about in a minute, but that's the cost of creating the product or service. And that gives me a gross profit. And then the gross profit is what I have left over to pay the operating expenses um, and hopefully have a profit when I'm building a successful and sustainable business after that. But again, you'll see I've divided everything by a thousand and removed all the, um, the decimal points uh, just to make it easier to read. Okay. Um, and what happens, the reason I've added more information to my slide template is that the income statement doesn't give enough information. So what I want to do when I'm, when I'm looking at this as a dashboard or when I'm presenting this to investors, I want to answer some additional questions and I want some more information to tell the story. So one of the things I like to do is include one or more key metrics at the top. So in this case, let's say this is a marketplace business the transactions that happened in that month, the number of transactions is a key metric for me. So that it took 972 transactions to create that $48,000 of revenue. These key metrics change based on the type of business. So it could be the number of sales, number of transactions, number of active subscribers, number of active users. It could be for a subscription business, it could be annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue. I might show two key metrics or three key metrics. Um, I'll show you in a second, in the case of a subscription business, I might show the number of active subscribers and the annual recurring revenue uh, and have two key metrics at the top of the slide. But that just helps tell the story of how my key metric growth drives the revenue growth. In addition, uh, headcount is crucial at startups. Uh, not only do I wanna see the number of full-time employees, I want to calculate the average annual revenue per employee or full-time equivalent. So in this case, uh, you know, I'm, I've hired too many people for this business, but again, that's standard startup stuff. Typically, um, typically you want to see the average revenue uh, and average annual revenue per employee be in the 200 to $400,000 range um, for a, normally functioning business. If you're running Apple or Google or Microsoft, you can do a million dollars or more per uh, employee. And then remember, uh, the income statement lies about cash, right? Much of what we've been talking about in this session is the income statement tells a different story. And so accountants and investors immediately, once they look at the income statement, say, that's great, show me the cash flow statement. And remember, there are all these reasons that, um, that we've discussed that the income statement and the cash flow statement don't match. So what I've done in my template is added a little piece of the uh, cash flow statement to the bottom of this template. And so this gives anyone looking at this, myself as a dashboard, an investor I'm trying to raise money from, 
everything they need to understand at a glance what both the income statement is and what the cash flow position looks like. And as startups, we live or die on cash. You know, I almost went out of business with a very healthy income statement. And because they're on the accrual basis, income statements lie about cash. And then another trick that I like in fundraising is I actually want to show the negative cash here so that investors realize I need the money. Sometimes if I only have positive numbers, uh, investors will ask, and I've heard this happen in meetings multiple times, they will ask, why do you need me if you're going to be making money from day one? And so if I'm showing negative numbers, I put that here. If I'm showing positive numbers, I'll include a line that shows where I'm raising money. So that explains the positive number. So you'll see those two lines there. All right, so now we're gonna build back up uh, what we had. So in this case, this is a subscription business. So we're gonna use two key metrics. We're gonna have the number of paid subscribers and we're gonna have the annual recurring revenue at the end of the period. We're gonna have uh, the income statement here, revenue, cost to sales, gross profit, operating expenses, EBITDA, we're gonna have the headcount and we're gonna have the cash available, that little piece of the cash flow statement at the end, uh, at the bottom of the sheet here. And in this case, I'm not showing any money raised from investors. I'm just gonna show the loss as negative numbers. And so the format I like to use either shows 12 individual months or because that can be information overload, I might show the first three months broken out and then show uh, three quarters of year one. So each quarter is three months. So this is 12 months, but it's only six vertical slices. And this makes it easier to digest what I'm seeing here. Um, often if I try to show just an annual uh, summary, investors will immediately ask to see uh, the first year broken out. So this solves that problem. And then I do show uh, year one. So it's a summary of everything that's broken out here. And then year two, and then year three. So now when I'm looking at this as a dashboard uh, or when I'm showing this to investors, we can do a deep granular dive on the first few months and quarters, and then look globally at year one, year two, year three. And what happens when you get good at this uh, is these numbers tell a story. And so investors are looking at, you know, 50 of these, 100 of these a month, and they get really good at reading between the lines and understanding what's happening. And just to give you a taste of that, here's what I see, and I'm just gonna look at the year one, year two, year three numbers. So I see that paid subscribers uh, 5X from 1100 to 5200, and then more or less, 3x uh, from 52 to um, 14,000. The revenue behaves, uh, sorry, the ARR beha behaves more or less the same way. The revenue does something different though, right? The revenue 10x's and then 3x's. So I'm wondering what the change is here that causes the paid subscribers to only 5x but the revenue to 10x. I'm guessing what happened is we introduced higher priced subscription tiers uh, between year one and year two. And those higher priced tiers are driving the revenue per subscriber up. Next, I'm gonna look at the cost of sales. So in the, in the case of a subscription business, let's say this is online only, these are gonna be uh, the hosting costs, the cloud costs, the customer support costs. And what I'm seeing is the cost of sales, the growth in cost of sales doesn't in any way keep up with the growth in revenue. So now I'm suspicious and I suspect this cost of sales is too low, right? If we're 10xing revenue, but only 5xing cost of sales, how is that possible? And then we're 3xing revenue here, but only 2xing cost of sales. So I suspect these uh, numbers underestimate what it's going to cost um, in terms of cost of sales or cost of goods sold. I also, in looking at this, uh, gross margin percentage. Typically, um, like if you look at a salesforce.com, they're doing about a 75%, 74% gross margin. Here we're seeing 88%, 92% gross margin. So again, I think we're underestimating uh, the cost of sales here. That leaves us money left over to run the business. And again, I'm not seeing the expenses ramp as quickly as the revenue. So again, I suspect we're underestimating what it's gonna cost us to run this business. 
That gives us uh, profit or loss, which is EBITDA. EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, it's a mouthful. Uh, it basically just means profit or loss on your income statement. Uh, and then when I look at the headcount, I see that I think we're um, over hiring in year one. We're probably about right on year two. And I'm using the metric I mentioned of average, am average annual revenue per employee. I expect to be kind of in the two hundred to four hundred thousand dollar range. So you know we we may not need all 16 people in year one. It looks like 18 is about right in year two, and it looks like 22 may be too few in uh, year three. So if we were to hire more people, I suspect we have to hire some more customer service people. That would cause the cost of sales to increase, and that would solve the margin percentage number, and it would also solve uh, what I'm seeing in the headcount. When I look at the cash number, it looks like we need at least we need to raise at least five hundred thousand dollars in order to finance this business. But I would need a little bit more information of, uh, you know, what is the month with the low point in cash. So that's what I see when I look at this. Um, and just remember, you're telling a story with your financials. Uh, again, you can grab this template. Uh, I will post it to the chat. Um, You can grab this template for free right there. Uh, there are a few more questions. What does EBITDA stand for? Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, interest is what, um, you know, what, what you're paying on loans. Taxes are taxes. Depreciation is if you buy something expensive, uh, you depreciate it over time versus expensing it all at once. And amortization, uh, you may never use as a startup, but that's the same thing as depreciation, but for an intangible item, like if you were to buy a company, the brand of value of that company would slowly decrease over time. That's called amortization. There's a different type of amortization, which is not part of EBITDA, which is if you get a loan, there's an amortization schedule, which is the payment schedule for that loan. Uh, when would be the best time to switch from LLC to S Corp? Uh, there's S Corp, there's C Corp. I don't know that you need to switch from LLC to S Corp. I would talk to a lawyer and an accountant. Um, Zap may be able to offer you some free legal sessions as well as free accounting sessions. Uh, most investors will want you to be a C Corp uh, to put the money in. So there may be a reason to switch from an LLC to a C Corp. I run my own business as an LLC because I have not taken any investment. Uh, great. That was awesome. That's what I like to hear. Uh, I will check out crisp, uh, to cancel out background noise. That sounds like a great, oh, so okay, awesome suggestion. I'm so worried because I have been Zoom bombed before. And so whenever there's like noise, yeah. I, literally it's like my uh, uh, my panic like starts because I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? <laughs> and at the same time, I'm like listening, but I have all my new members coming in to ask me questions. We're in the office, so it's a crazy time. But... Yes. Any other questions? No worries. Um, hi. I have a, I have a, um, I have, hi, I'm a resume writer and I have a customer database portal that I work with. Um, I'm actually on the advisory committee, so I never have to pay for using it. And I was putting the numbers in there and I noticed some of the figures, I was amazed at how much money my little part-time business was making. And, and maybe some of that stuff you were saying, when I put in the expenses and stuff, it just looked so much, it looked so rich. So uh, I, I guess I've been taking notes and I'm, I'm gonna email the owner and let him know I'm learning about these financials. But um, what I did is I just took 60% of my cell phone bill because, People obviously call me and email me for written documents, and I just put what 60% of that bill was for the year. And um, I, my, my house burned down. This is very specific. So, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you. We're uh, hopefully and prayerfully, I'll be home 
before the end of October. So, um, and so everything has been a business expense and a personal expense. So I just put the $19,000 hotel bill on my taxes for my business because I just did. I don't know about the percentages. So I need some help. If there's a percentage of what you're supposed to put for different things, I just need that. Take, take Zap up on the free accounting session. Yeah, okay. let me um, put my email in the chat. Uh, so hopefully, as on, you were on board and you, at, you made a profile on the yeah, East Advising nice. platform, and there I you can book a meeting. Um, I think one of the sections is like accounting, and you can book a meeting and someone can kind of like sit down with you and go through all the numbers. Oh, great. Okay. I have to get back to I don't know if Mike has that expertise. <laughs> okay, thank you. And it's, it's super uh, situation specific. And I'm realizing I forgot to answer one question at the beginning. We talked briefly about, uh, someone had a question about the freemium model. The freemium model works great uh, if you are Facebook or if you are Slack or if you are Dropbox. Um, and so with Facebook, they were very specific about building the community as big as they could before they monetized. Um, that was a very expensive undertaking, right? So they had to raise all kinds of money in order to stay alive long enough to build a big enough user base that they could then monetize it. So that's totally fine if you're able to raise money like Facebook. Um, and Peter Thiel actually tells a story uh, you know, he was the first $500,000 check. The reason he wrote that check is because uh, Facebook needed the money to spend on servers because they were so popular that they were running out of server space all the time. And he says that makes it easy for him to make, make the decision to write that check, right? Uh, so you just need to have a way to pay for all of that time that you're providing all of that uh, service. For Slack or Dropbox, um, it's a very calculated user acquisition strategy. So they can get teams of people inside an organization using Slack or Dropbox for free and use that as a way to get into companies that they normally wouldn't be able to get into and then expand and then show up and say, okay, now you, you need to buy an enterprise license. Um, again, that's a very specific strategy and um, you know, just be careful because those freemium users have a lot of costs associated with them, uh, which is not to say you can't make the model work. You just need to figure out how to pay for it, right? Um, so just be aware of that with the freemium users. I also, actually one more thing I will say about freemium users. Customers are people who pay you. Users are people who hang around for free. And there is a very big difference, you know, as you're building an organization, if you accidentally designed a bunch of features for users expecting them to become customers and they don't become customers, you have then designed a bunch of features that attract free users but don't attract customers. So you need to be really careful about who you're designing features for and making sure that you're getting the behavior you're looking for out of the people who are ultimately going to drive the revenue in your organization. And if you're not doing that, you need to fix it quickly because that also gets really expensive. <laughs> well, we're finding it's a small world in the chat box today. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love, love the reconnections. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, it is 2.06, so we probably have to wrap up, folks, but is there any final questions for Mike? Well, I guess we'll wrap up then. The toughest thing about these virtual events, I'll tell you what, is we can't give you a round of applause, but uh, in replacement, I really appreciate you being here, Mike. I'll shoot an email uh, kind of with the link to Mike's website if you want to learn more, and I'll have the link to rewatch this video if you'd like to. Yeah, and my email is just um, mike at rocketproformer.com. Whoops, oh, sorry, I sent that to the wrong channel. Uh, but you can find me here, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I make a lot of videos, so if you want more of this, I have lots and lots of videos uh, trying to make numbers fun for people.
I love it. And uh, yeah, I'll shoot, I'll put his email in the follow up as well. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Bye.